I'll see if I can do that. And then maybe he can post it, but it's definitely not a uh, live streaming. Anyway, we'll go ahead and I'll turn it over to um, Corey and let her call the meeting to order. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, again, happy holidays um, <clears throat> to include my birthday tomorrow. Um, <laughs> we want to uh, officially bring uh, this meeting to order at um, 10, 10 a.m. Um, was there an agenda that was sent out, Donna? Yes. Okay. All right, so you should have um, had an opportunity to review um, the agenda. Um, were there any additions or modifications that needed to be um, done to the agenda for today? Okay, um, so by consensus, can we approve the agenda that was distributed? Awesome, thank you. <laughs> We don't need to do thumbs up and all that great stuff because everybody's in agreement. Um, and so with that being said, um, I will hand it right back over to Dr. Fullman for the video e report. Yes, and I would like to say uh, welcome to everybody. And um, I'm thrilled, you know, everyone's in attendance right here before the holidays. And um, looking forward to a little bit of time off myself, but not a lot, but some, and hopefully uh, some of y'all will have a little more time off to uh, kind of regroup. Um, I know there's a lot of stress from the teachers that I've talked to, so I'm sure you're under the same pressures they are. Um, but with that, I'd like to go ahead and start the update. Um, and I'm going to start by, by kind of starting with the consortium, which was on the list. And I know the consortium did a parent night, but if somebody from the consortium would like to speak up and, and talk about that, I'd be happy to have them do that. I was trying to see who here is on the consortium board. Might not have anybody. Donna, I used to be, but had to resign um, that position with my change in what I'm doing. Okay. So um, just briefly, I know they had a parents night um, and they ran uh, something at night and um, Dara, I see you have your hand up. It's hard for me to all this stuff on a little TV screen. That was not intentional. I'm not sure how that happened. Sorry oh, about okay. <laughs> all right. Um, anyway, uh, they, they ran a parents' night, and I'm not sure how well attended that was or anything because I haven't really had a feedback on it. And I'm used to having people that are on that committee, um, on that board, sit on this committee. But um, so I know that is one thing that consortium is doing, and they, they're looking at doing smaller things throughout the year instead of having one big meeting like they had in the fall just due to the COVID issues. So um, I'm sure they'll have something coming up in this spring, winter, spring timeframe um, after the start of the year. Uh, the next thing on the agenda is, get back to that, um, AYGS. And so uh, this year, um, uh, uh, unlike any of the other years, I mean, it's pretty much been the same. We put in for um, funding um, for academic year governor schools. And just to give you some history, um, these programs have just been funded um, through a formula that really had, it makes no particular sense, rhyme, or reason in terms of the funding. And for years, it stayed the same. 
um, which was like a thousand dollars per student before they looked at the composite index of the school division where the student came from and whether the program was a full day or half day program, it, it just, the funding formula really didn't make any sense. So several years ago, and I think it's been six or seven years ago, the General Assembly asked the DOE to do a study and look at different ways that these programs might be funded. And they came up with like eight or nine different scenarios and they narrowed it down to one, which was to fund these programs similar to to the way schools are funded, um, funding certain positions, which regardless of how many students you have, you have to have a director, you know? So there were certain positions that were funded based on the SOQ and, um, and that did make it into the governor's budget one year, but got shot down in the general assembly. And so every year we've gone back and tried to get this into the governor's budget and it has not made it back into the governor's budget, but we're hopeful this year that it may. Um, and so the academic year governor school directors are waiting to find out if this funding, new funding mechanism, which would actually fund it like a school should be, <laughs> And then there's concessions made for half day programs. So of course they would only get half the funding. Um, but uh, anyway, we're hopeful that it will make it in there. And if not, they're looking at strategies to try to get it put into the new biennium budget. Um, and in terms of the summer residential governor schools, we're those programs have not had increased funding for several, several years. And so we're looking at increasing state funding for both summer residential programs as well as World Language Academies, because of course, every year the cost of housing and um, food go up, um, but the program contracts do not. <laughs> and so, um, we're looking to increase funding there as well as potentially um, starting a new mentorship program for it would be for only 18 students, but um, it would deal with applied sciences and be housed at William and Mary along with the two other mentorship programs and utilize the new applied science lab that they have there. Um, and that, that's, again, another request that went to the governor's budget. We'll see if that makes it through. Uh, the next thing on our list is the VAG. Um, and I don't know, Wendy, would you like to update us on VAG? Sure. And Corey, please feel free to um, you know, add in any additional information. But in October, we had a wonderful parent evening and we had Dr. Susan Baum, who is really a leader in our field in the area of ser providing services for twice exceptional students. And she was wonderful. She talked about it, the, the idea or the top, general topic was executive function and supporting them and developing their executive function skills. And um, she did it from a different perspective, she says, find their strengths in that area and find their style and just support it for them to help them develop um, those skills. And she was spectacular. It was very well received. It was a free event, but I think that really helped us in terms of awareness and to let parents and families out in our state know that we are an organization there to help support them. So we had obviously a variety of you know, many parents there, but gifted educators as well and administrators. So we were very proud of that event. And right now we are in the planning phase about what our professional development will look like in the future, whether next year we will look at a conference or if we will be looking at some regional events. So right now we're, that's, you know, where we are in the planning. And so hopefully I'll have some good news to share uh, when we meet again. 
Okay, and I apologize. I, I was thinking the parents' night was the consortium, but it was VAG. Um, and so I'm not sure what the consortium's been doing. I, I know they had some um, guest speakers lined up. So um, let's see. Next on our list is the regulations. So I think I mentioned last time that the regulations were going to be reviewed by Ed Trust and uh, they would go come back to the department in the June 2022 timeframe. Um, I did meet with the person assigned to that a grad student, uh, Brittany, and um, I'm not sure why, but her, her she, um, came back a couple of weeks later and said her internship would end in December um, and she would not be continuing on in terms of working on this project. Um, I did send her her data request um, around the first part of December and um, we have not been notified as to who the new person will be um, in terms of kind of conducting this review through June. So once I learn more about that, I'll let you know. Um, but I know she she did indicate her internship was ending in December and someone else would be taking her place, but right now we just don't know who that is. Um, the next thing on the list is the technical review. And these were, we have volunteers across the state. We paired them up in teams of three, sometimes four, and they um, were assigned a particular um, division's local plan to review. And those are due back to me by December. Um, while we have received some, there's probably more than half of them still left out. And so um, just waiting to get those back and, and um, you know, review them and send them out to the school divisions. Um, and then finally, well, not finally, but on our list of things is the annual report and the dashboard. And so um, the Virginia Department of Education has decided to make data available on a new dashboard format. And this will have some graphics tied to it. And so right now, when you go online um, for enrollment data and demographics, you can call down, a, I think it's an Excel spreadsheet. And um, some of the things that this new company AIS network will be doing. Well, I, I see I, I have a, a note. Let me see if I can get um, Tracy back as a panelist. Um, but AIS network is going to present the demographics um, and gifted will be added to that list. Currently, there's a lot of things you can pull down on the spreadsheet, but you can't get the gifted information. But what you will be able to get is um, uh, a comparison between the gifted information and the division information. So we won't go down to the school level like some of the data is allowed uh, allows you to select a school and look at it at a school level. You will not be able to do that with gifted, but you will be able to see it at the division level and you will be able to see a comparison with um, the division level demographics. So it'll be like uh, how many um, students in the division are, um, you know, a certain ethnicity, and then it will say how many students in the gifted program are certain ethnicity, and it'll give you some kind of chart comparison. Um, but it is really 
it's very limited. There's not a lot of stuff. I know we had talked a lot about changing the annual report and what that might look like. Um, and then uh, there, there's lot, a lot of things that we talked about that are not gonna be there. It's just gonna be the basic gifted information. Um, by ethnicity, by um, race, by gender, and potentially by um, twice exceptional, I think. I think it's the other thing. Um, and it may, I'm not sure there will, it will be free and reduced lunch, but um, anyway. I know Melanie asked, are they going to use the representation index formula? No, they are not. I argued for that and they opted. They said, no, we're just, we don't do that with anything else. And we aren't going to do that here. So, so it still might be, and, and there might be something for ELL. Yes, Lori. Um, there... There's still the potential once the regulations come back for us to make changes to the annual report. And I'm just kind of holding off on that because there's a lot of stuff going on with the new election. Um, and I just wanna wait and see how everything plays out and what comes back as part of the um, review before we spend a lot of time, because we already have spent a lot of time on this annual report and we have a lot of good information and good place definitely you know to start from and actually it's probably almost finished but um i don't want to spend any more time on it till we know exactly what what kind of our marching orders are if you if you want to call them that um so are there any questions about those things? I have one more thing to bring up, but are there any questions about those? You can unmute yourself and just chime in. To clarify this for me, the person who is reviewing the regulations for the state of Virginia, it's an internship project? So this was um, contracted through Ed Trust mm -hmm. and the student um, was a graduate student, and this was an internship she was doing mm -hmm. with Ed Trust, right. and and that's all I know. Okay. Isn't Other than she said her internship ended, and someone else would be assigned to this. Okay. I just want clarification because I, I have some other questions later. <laughs> okay. Um, so one other thing I kind of want to bring to your attention, just so you know. Um, so this, since potentially there are things that would go before the General Assembly, um, I want you to know that this is what we call a long session and it starts January 12th and goes to March 12th. Um, and that includes all the holidays in there, Martin Luther King Day and, and uh, President's Day. Um, and so part of what we will do is look to see what is in the governor's budget when it comes out on December 16th as part of a, a joint money committee meeting between, I guess, the um, House and the Senate, and the governor will release his budget, and then it will, um, I guess, be modified or put into a format that's accessible on our website, but that will probably be on that 
I think the 16th is a Thursday. So it probably won't show up on our DOE website link until Friday. But hopefully I will, you know, uh, hear something on the 16th as to the different components that um, I had hoped to move forward through the governor's budget, whether they're in there or not. Um, so the first day of the session is January 12th. And then all bills or anything that uh, members of the House and Senate are going to put forward have to be completed by the 14th. So that's two days um, later. And then um, uh, an inauguration of the governor is on the 15th. And what we call crossover, that's when the, the budget and the bills and stuff from one from the House go to the Senate and from the Senate go to the House and they look at what's there and then they make, um, you know, make decisions to try to rectify everything and come to one budget, one kind of set of bills and everything. And then it's adjourned on March 12th. So through that process, um, you know, there will be, there may be opportunities that people in the General Assembly reach out to our policy folks who reach out to me to discuss more issues uh, related to policy and what's in place and what's being done. And, and then of course, funding questions. So um, that is a busy, very busy time of year, especially in the long session, although it's not much longer than the short session, but it still seems longer, put it that way. Um, but there will be a lot of changes from a political standpoint and what that means for the DOE, we just have to um, wait and see. Uh, you know, we can't speculate, but I will say, you know, with the governor elect's um, uh, campaign focused on K-12 education. And so I suspect you know, there could potentially be a lot of changes in K-12 education. I ju just don't know. But anyway, it, it will be, um, you know, I'll keep you informed as best I can and when I know something. Um, but potentially, there could be a lot of changes in the upcoming year. Any other questions? regarding updates or something you wanted to know in particular. I know some people have been interested in the math pathways and there's some changes going on with regard to that. Um, I'm not sure exactly what um, changes will be made and the new administration may have some say in that as well. So I'm just kind of, um, holding on to, um, you know, to, to move forward with anything with gifted and the math pathways till we know exactly how that's going to work out. Any other questions? I have a question, Donna, in regards back to the um, dashboard and annual report, will there be information about advanced coursework? Um, the model that we originally looked at showed access to those sorts of things. Will that be included or no? No. Okay. It will be, if you go online and look at the, um, you have to go to enrollment and demographics, um, and then it gives you a chance to like look at fall membership. Um, and there's just some very basic stuff about all students, you know, in, in the school divisions and stuff. And that is just that basic information is what will be provided with regard to gifted. 
and they aren't looking at doing anything additional on our website, which doesn't mean that we can't have that available through SSWS for divisions as part of the annual report. Did that answer your question okay? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Donna, yeah. by reporting, um, reporting out on the dashboard by divisions, will that dilute the um, impact of academic year governor schools is what they pull up? Um, so they can't, right now they can't pull up academic year governor schools separately. And the students that are in academic year governor schools, all their information goes back to the school division because governor schools are technically, even though they're called a school, <laughs> they're technically a program. Um, they are not a school. They do not issue credit. They do not award credit. They do not issue diplomas. All those go through the school division and the student is a student of record for that school division. And so, um, so the division gets to count all that information. Um, and so there is no way for you to call out separately a governor's school. Is that what, if that's what you're asking? Well, I know it, that's the way it was in the past. I just wasn't sure currently if they um, had a way of reporting because it it does make it a little bit different. You can't data mine unless you go through the academic governor school information. That is correct. The governor school director would have to provide you with any kind of demographics that you may be requesting. Um, and you know, one thing to always keep in mind with regard to that is that um, these schools, for the most part, are dependent on the school divisions to send them the students. They are not, um, you know, while they may score information or they may. Um, work with the divisions on a selection process, many of them are dependent on the divisions to say, these are the students we are going to send you. And so they may not have any impact um, in terms of, of the selection process. The other thing to note is um, while some division, some divisions demographics are very different and so, um, you know, they, their, their demographics, while you say, well, they're not um, supporting, you know, diversity in this program, they may not have a very one diverse population in that school division. And then also, they may not have a very diverse population in the gifted program that helps provide a pathway to that. And that, that's a whole nother issue that really we were hoping to address with our regulations. So, um, Melanie, I know you had your hand up for a question. Um, <clears throat> this question has come up uh, with our county as well, um, especially when we do um, nominate students who are from historically underserved uh, programs or, or communities rather, and they may be disadvantaged for all other reasons of not having access to opportunity. And then their participation then is limited based on the, um, the governor school application or adjudication process. And um, with it being dependent on the local on division or the local division that houses the governor school, it's somewhat um, leaves it up to chance without being some really intentional language and policy and practice around making sure that the governor's school program, which is to represent the entire state, uh, 
actually would represent the state. So I feel that um, by stating that it's dependent on the division to submit the students is a passive way of um, accepting or, or, or addressing that. And I think that there might be a more directive, uh, intentional way of, of supporting um, more diverse access and participation in the governor school residential programs and um, academic school year programs. Okay, so bo both, I was going to ask, are you talking about summer or are you talking about um, academic year? So academic year is something where the regional governing board makes a decision with regard to um, participation and selection process. So I would say that um, gifted coordinators should be working with the mem their member on the that governing board to make changes to academic year selection process. Um, in the state um, process, we are going to start moving towards collecting um, additional demographic data on the students that are applying or accepted. And um, it probably at the acceptance level. And then from there, we might um, make some decisions with regard to, you know, what we're seeing. Are, are we seeing a disproportionality in those students? Right now, we don't know. We don't have, really don't have that data. Um, but it is something that um, way back before I came to this office, it was part of the application process. It didn't carry any any weighting or, or any configuration into the points that were awarded. It was only there um, for information purposes. And then somebody felt like it also um, provided a mechanism for discrimination um, in terms of, you know, they could see that the student was either of this race or was low SES or whatever, and could could have make a decision on whether their application moved forward or not, um, and whether it got selected at the state level or not. So that was removed. Um, and um, yeah. I'm sorry, that, um, that was a trend in a lot of governor schools around the nation. Uh, to, to make it kind of colorblind, what is referred to as colorblind applications. Yeah. And um, the, the data shows that as a result of removing that, the um, acceptance rate defaulted to the dominant culture. So it you then moved away from uh, admission, even though they, they were saying that, well, ethnicity was uh, putting these students at a disadvantage by identifying that, um, by removing any sort of identifiable characteristic, it completely um, reversed. And you, you can see that in magnet programs around the nation, as well as um, governor schools. So there are new and recommended practices about how to be very intentional with making sure, and there are formulas of making sure that the students who have access and participate in these programs are representative of the population, of the community that they serve. Um, that would be my recommendation, just to be more intentional and have very deliberate language. Um, and so that we can have uh, equitable access and opportunities for all students. Um, you know, because we do have a lot of families that that would benefit from these opportunities, but because mm -hmm. of circumstances beyond their control, uh, it is they are at a disadvantage. I th I think one way too that maybe um, some of the gifted coordinators need some education on is that uh, they can rank these students different from score rank, and so. They could look at other um, components and rank students differently because um, one of the things we do look it for is um, I do a scan to see 
if school divisions have ranked students in the top uh, of, of the students they submitted, but those students didn't get in. And so I look at not only the program and the competition they're against, but why were they ranked number one in this division and they didn't make it in to, to the program that they applied for. Um, so that, and that's one way to rank, rank students differently that doesn't really, isn't based on score, but it is based on some other mechanism that the school division has determined is important uh, to them. Um, and so there, there could be other ways to look at um, submitting student names for the summer programs that have a different ranking um, than just a score. But certainly that gives us something to look, look for in this new upcoming year with, um, you know, with hopefully things going online. I think there's a parent component too in educating the parents because um, it's very different for a student to be in their um, community school and then be selected to go to some place that's maybe not close to their community and the other and looking at the other barriers that are part of that. Um, and that goes along with the um, report and webinar that was put out a year ago where AERA um, had the um, monitoring, uh, monitoring educational equity and was the National Academies Forum. And we looked at that last year as a as an advisory group um, and, and their recommendations really broaden and, and pretty much say that, you know, we haven't listened to the students who have been part of a program or who have not been part of a program and, and understanding more what that means within the demographics of the communities, as Melanie was saying, that, you know, some things are not as global as we think they are from the research because the data that some of the research is pulling from doesn't give a full picture. So um, if uh, one of the things I wanted to offer today, if those of you on the um, board have not read the monitoring educational equity, uh, we could send that link later because that was something we looked at last year. Um, really quickly, um, Donna, um, one thing, <clears throat> because we just actually just finished, we're still in the process, of course, as you know, uh, with um, moving things forward with our, our students for uh, the summer residential governor school programs. And um, as someone that's kind of on the front lines, it, it's still, you, you have to drill down even further is it really is a branding situation, school by school, as well as providing access to those programs. So if they don't know about it, they're not going to apply. And so as a um, gifted education teacher, but also in the classroom with students who uh, would be right there in the pipeline to apply, um, you know, I, I did a pitch in class and talked to them about it, but then also um, providing just the access to the information and how to lead school counselor to do an email blast about the information as well as the principal shooting out information and reminding people about um, this opportunity that their student could be a part of. Um, but getting back to Melanie's point about the index, if you don't have identified students in your building, because um, right now we're sitting upwards of, I think, I know we're over a thousand students in this building, and I have 17, one seven identified African American gifted students in this building. Now I know when I did the index, and did the formula, um, that is not where we're supposed to be. Are we working towards that? Absolutely. We're, we, we know what it is and we, we have to work towards that. 
But the thing about it is, is you have school divisions that are not, they're either, um, they have to be intentional about identification processes. And then from there, giving access and providing access to those students or those, um, to, really to everyone, but to definitely encourage individuals who don't think that this is something that they can be a part of. Um, and But thankfully I have, um, out of the students that are coming from my school that we're putting forward um, to our students of color. Um, and so you, you really have to be intentional um, about branding, about marketing. I mean, it really comes down to marketing, but then also access to, to the information and then kind of encouraging instead of being a gatekeeper um, for the information. That, that's really what it comes down to. I know that I'm preaching to the choir, um, but we need, to, we need to recruit more choir members, I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> okay, thank you for those insights. And um, this may be something that I put a, a subcommittee together um, in the upcoming months. And we talk more about in terms of um, changes that might be done at the departmental level um, and how to, and reaching out to different organizations within the state to also get the word out as well. Um, anything else before we move on to the brainstorming part? Okay, Corey, I'll turn this over to you. Thank you, Donna. So um, in kind of discussing how we were going to um, work through this portion um, of the agenda, uh, what we thought about doing was instead of doing breakout rooms, which I didn't know logistically we could do that, and I don't think Donna thought we could as well, is that we would um, make it more of a flipped sort of format. So that's why we sent out that information to you in terms of the top two topics that came back in the survey uh, that um, our committee was most interested in. And I'm trying to pull up my notes. Um, so the first one is 82% um, um, were interested in and would like to discuss an equitable identification and service um, for gifted learners across all demographic groups. Um, and then in second place, uh, almost 60% was support for differentiated instruction for classroom teachers. And so I, let's see, pull everybody back up again. So I guess we could start with um, identification process. And if, if we wanna just kind of go around maybe and share some ideas. Um, that you brought um, to the conversation today. Um, it's very ironic. I could, I could start and then just pass it around, I guess, if people want to just jump in or what have you, raise your hand. Um, it's very ironic that we I mean, I just talked about um, possible use of um, the equity index to inform uh, planning and on the identification process. Um, I mean, we've, we've already talked about that, but I, I really don't know, and maybe someone could, could enlighten me, what is the trepidation in the use of the index? Because I'm not at that level, I'm, I'm in the classroom. So I'm not at the 30,000 foot view, so. If someone enlighten me. It's, we started using it uh, this year and in the years past, the, um, the way that they looked at the data, they looked at it as a, a parody. So you would take the whole of mm -hmm. children identified as gifted. And then within that number of students, basically mm -hmm. comparing the different categorical demographic groups. So they're basically, you know, comparing, um, you know, black students to Hispanic students to white students that are identified as gifted. The problem with that is that 
for, for divisions that have either um, do not have a an equal or or mm -hmm. a uh, maybe have more more population than other or or mm -hmm. anything mm -hmm. varied people would get the representation index is just a new way of thinking about it because mm -hmm. um, but it's it's just a, a different step and it shows the data different but it it still shows that there is a um, disconnect and I think it's just an awareness element. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um for us and and you know we were able to we have a data person for our division which i don't know if that's unusual um and uh, so it must be unusual and mm -hmm. so she does she does data analysis as well as um data visualization for external consumption so um and that's really been very helpful mm -hmm. um especially when you have a division that's focused on um, addressing issues of equity and access and culturally responsive teaching. It gives us information so that we can make um, productive uh, decisions and intentional practices. Um, <clears throat> so, and then, and I don't know if this answers your question, Corey, at all, um, but in regards to identification practices, and Albemarle County shifting to a more talent development model, which is, mm -hmm. I think, focused on all students' strengths. It, right. it makes it even more complicated because then you have to kind of redefine what the role of gifted, the gifted label is, right. um, and how and how does that play in the child's education? And so, that's where the, um, you know, like uh, the regulations, the state regulations, come into play with that. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's that's some like 30,000 feet mm -hmm. considerations that have to happen. And it, it kind of confirms what I thought, which is it, it really doesn't matter whether it's at the school level, division level, or where have you, is it has to be a choice. It has to be a programmatic thrust. It has to be intentional that this is something that we are going to focus on. Um, and that, that kind of comes up in, in one of my other ideas or what have you, but it's it, it has to be a focus. Um, if they don't think that it's 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 um, it's important, then it gets kind of pushed to the side. And so it's it's you kind of confirmed what I I, I, I was thinking. Um, but at any rate, um, Dara, you have your hand. So I have a question. Um, this is year six for me. And so I know uh, a lot of other people haven't been on. So how many people just in this panel, the choir, um, are familiar <laughs> with the 2017 report that VACEG did? Is everybody familiar yeah. with it? Okay. Yeah. So that, that was one of the things that I was thinking is that, you know, uh, in 2017, we did a report on increasing diversity and gifted education programs. In Virginia, we talked about identification, and then we did some additional work on that um, through time. So I'm wondering how far, how we get the word out, um, how we communicate um, this information, because I think that what I, what I always wonder is, how are we utilizing, we can create resources, we can create conversations, we can talk about it um, here. How do we get the word out in a way that is meaningful and that um, creates change? How do we become the change agent? for this to happen at the division level? It's, it's a question and I don't have an answer for it, but I think that that's the question that I wonder because I think we can create right. documentation. I think we can say this needs to be done. I don't know how we help to make it happen at the division level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Dara, just to real quick and then I'll, I'll pass it um, on to Melanie is that literally on, in each one of these sections that I had, I have update reports for VBOE, but because we have some that um, have been, uh, that, that were completed and placed on the website that are over 10 years old. I think the newest one is the 2017 report that, that we worked on. Um, and so it, again, it comes back to, we're doing the good work 
now we need to let people know about the good work. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's fantastic that it's on the website, but we've got to, again, recruit more choir members and get the word out about what it is that we're doing and point people in that direction that we we have some ideas, we have some resources available, with, and here it is for public consumption. Melanie? So um, I think, and I'm, I'm very proud of the work that, that came before me with like the work that Maureen Jensen did and, and the folks in Navalmar County, because um, I think the, the focus on uh, culturally responsive education has been uh, of important impetus to make some of these decisions and make some um, policy and practice changes. We, I think for other divisions, what I'm understanding is that, you know, cause there's a lot of uh, scholarly research around uh, talent development, but to put it into practice is, a, is another conversation. And so, um, and that's what, you know, my team has been working on and like, how do we articulate this so it is replicable in other settings? Um, and, and that's the, there's gotta be, you know, you have to create time for that. Like, cause how often do we sit down and say, okay, this is how I did this. Um, and then finding spaces to share that. Um, I, I really believe in the work that that's happening in Ambalmar County and I, mm -hmm. our data around talent development is showing that we are reaching more students than through, uh, the gifted child framework, um, allowed access. So I don't, I mean, I would be willing to, to work and finding ways to, to communicate to the rest of the state or other division, if that's a priority or if that's an interest. Um, it's just finding the, the time and, um, and, you know, that, that part of it. But I, I agree, like, there's a lot of great scholarly research. It's just um, having the, the opportunity to interpret it and translate it to um, actionable steps, as well as making sure all the stakeholders quite understand it. Um, mm -hmm. Because it's a, it's a huge paradigm shift for community, for just as a nation, even Virginia, when, um, when we functioned for so long uh, with this perception of a gifted, a gifted child. Uh, mm -hmm. as a, and so that's, it's a complicated change. So, um, but I think it's definitely possible. Mm -hmm. Um, recently, I, I met with one of the local school divisions in my area, and we just had a general conversation. They asked me to come in and we talked about, you know, what are some key points of discussion in the literature, but also just, you know, applying it. And it was a great 45 minute session. And they gave me really good feedback in that they just needed that boost to, to you know, just kind of refocus. My other point I wanted to bring up from this um, document of the monitoring equity, um, I've been through it several times. And one of the key things that I've been working on locally that I'm starting to see that maybe we, we, can, we can open up um, to find out what the state's doing as far as informal education and how that's involved. That's one of the points that was mentioned is that we don't always see a gifted child with talents in the classroom the way they're sitting and what they're doing. They don't have a chance to share that. And I personally involved with a family development center once a week. And, and now we're to the point where the center is seeing some of these children and we're going back and having conversations with the schools. And if, and 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 some of that in in the um, resonated from that forum last year is that in some cases it's the after school programs, the YMCA programs, um, people that are working with the children that need to be part of the conversation at some point or provide um, provide artifacts to show that you know. Johnny really has shown all these things and, and how can that be documented and shared? If I can, I have a I, question. I, okay. Hi, Rebecca Musso here. I just have a question about that. Um, 
in my county here in Stafford, we allow or we invite anybody to make recommendations and often seek that out. Am I misunderstanding? No, that's that's definitely what should be done. Right. So so it's a matter of um, maybe um, I guess bringing it to the forefront that those are one of the the ways that could be done. That you know there may not be that that synergistic conversation that we think is there, and that maybe as a group we show elements of how that's being done. One one thing I want to kind of bring up just because I see this is constantly something I wrestle with in our state is that part our state calls gifted students gifted for the program of services provided by the division. It's no reflection on how strong the student might be in any category of content area or skills and abilities other than what the division has decided is the area they're going to provide as a program of service. And it is very confusing for people to think that gifted in our state means the students who are either really smart in a certain area or smart or, or skilled at a certain level, you know, in the visual and performing arts, it does not. It only means the kids who are identified for the program of services offered by the division. And I try to make this very clear to parents as well, that if your child is really smart in mathematics and the school division has decided that a gifted kid is only the kid who is smart in English, your child will not be identified gifted. And so when we start looking at trying to make sure that we have everybody on the same page in terms of all the divisions, we have to remember that their definition of a gifted student is not a universal definition like the child is really smart or has a high IQ or can play, you know, Bach at age three. I mean, there, there's no, there's no universal kind of understanding like people normally think, oh, gifted means this. It only means the kid who meets the qualifications for the program of services offered by the division. And maybe we need a different term, you know, to for our state instead of gifted. I, I don't know, but um, it, how does that translate if someone is moving from one division to another they um, can, along their education pathway? Yeah, they, they can be gifted in one division and not in another. Very easily, very easily, you know, Donna, and yes. What are our chances in Virginia of, ha of having some sort of statewide universal language and identification criteria? I know that Virginia for a long time has been very adamant that local divisions contain and and retain local control, but would we ever have any opportunity to provide even some minimal baseline identification criteria or universal language? Uh, I mean, I can't say never, but our state has always gone for local control. And, you know, in some ways that's a good thing but it's very hard to explain to parents. And even, you know, I had a hard time explaining it to the judge when I testified for three hours that gifted is not just being smart or just having a high IQ or, you know, something like that. Um, I'm sure there are lots of kids that would qualify as 
gifted under some kind of universal screening, but don't at the school division level because they don't match up with the program of services offered. Um, and But, you know, that's hard for people to understand, especially when they're looking at data and they don't understand why are we not getting all these kids that they think they should get, but it has to do more with the definition and the program of services offered. And will we ever go to a statewide model? Like I said, sometimes it has its advantages. I can't see applying a statewide model to Fairfax County and the same exact thing to Lee County. I mean, it, if the numbers aren't there to support programs and models and things like that, then there could be some, you know, difference in terms of the kinds of services that are offered mm -hmm. for the kids that are supposedly the same, you know, but um, I think if you read the reg, the one thing about the, the most recent regulations is that there is very clear language within the areas. Um, what we're chat with the challenges, and this is um, something that we, we would have to determine how to have control over it is or how to address it is that uh, everyone, as Donna said, is coming with their preconceived ideas of what this word, what the, the word gifted means. And so um, even, even within my own division, I found language, uh, front-facing language that was communicating the wrong thing. So, so it's just about saying, you know, because being gifted in Albemarle County, it, we use general intellectual ability. But Charlottesville City, which is, you know, nestled right in Applemark County, uses um, academic content, so subject specific. So even within the, the region, it's very different. And um, it and so, again, you can see the pros and cons of being very responsive to your community and what their values are. Um, but then you also have to provide the systems to support the students who are showing strengths in areas that may not be identified by the school and then or the division. And so um, this is where that complicated process of, of helping folks shift that mindset. Um, I'm going to share another article in here that has some a really nice um, kind of explanation of the, the three primary frameworks around the work we do. It's that kind of gifted child paradigm, the talent development paradigm, and differentiated instruction paradigm. And that really helps kind of us, gives us some language around like, what's the purpose of the services or program? Who receives the, per the program or services? How do they get access? And what is it changing? So it's very tight. It's just a real, it's a good resource. So I'll share that and I'll stop talking. I just wanted to share um, that I, I kind of think like the elephant in the room, like we've, we've used the word choir quite a bit. And I do think that this choir is absolutely in support of having greater diversity and more equity in gifted education. I, I, I think like as a, um, as a school board member that oftentimes, you know, like a lot of times we're responding to mandates and we're responding to um, what the public has told us our priorities, either by us surveying them or by public comment or those kinds of things. And I don't know yet if there's the public will that, that we're really pursuing this, that we pursue this um, with fidelity. Um, so I, I guess like I'm looking at ways that we can we can make this more public so that there is more pressure um, put on like this is a priority. This is something that we're not paying a lot of attention to in a lot of places. And this is something that that we need to um, because these are the outcomes if we don't. Um, so I just kind of wanted to put that out there for what it's worth. I, I feel like it's like it, it, we're all kind of we're, we're in support of this, but until we get a greater support, and I don't know, I mean, I'm sure you all have seen the news. I mean, with these last elections, 
you know, there was a lot of talk about no CRT in our schools. Well, I think that this is all kind of interrelated. Um, you know, when, when we start talking about how we want equity and gifted education, there's going to be an outcry of people who are thinking that this is a pie and that we're taking their slice. Um, and so I think that that's, I, I don't know if that discussion belongs here, but I think until we address some of those things, I don't know how much progress we can really make. Yeah. I, mean, I think that was part of you know, our, our attempt at the regulations with the requirement that a new <laughs> revised kind of annual report with data and comparisons and, and information would be presented to school boards um, to make this more of a public issue. Um, and that was our intent in the, re in the change, as one of the changes in the regulations, as well as the requirement for a talent development program for young students. And in that way, not only will we build to the strengths and see strengths of, of students that maybe school divisions hadn't seen in the past, but also give them an opportunity to say, hey, we've missed this whole population of students that have this strength that we're not even addressing, you know, in our program model. And it may be that their program model actually shifts, you know, based on the kinds of talents that they see at the younger grades. And, and without those things in place, you know, it's, I, I feel like we're, we're kind of taking the work that we did on identification across our state back in 2017 and trying to look at ways that we can maybe brainstorm how we can get that information maybe updated um, out to school divisions. Uh, and it may not be, you know, we only have two more meetings to be able to move that forward. Um, it could be, you know, by, by June, we have more insights on the regulations and how those are gonna progress. Um, I just don't know. Right. It's it's there's definitely a thin line, um, Shannon, um, across the board. Whether you're in the classroom, you're in the front office, you're in central office, or you're on the school board, there's a fine line. And the the reality is, is that you have um, technically, I wouldn't say technically, because it depends on the area. Um, you have a few squeaky wheels, but you have a, a large majority of individuals out there that support um, what we're doing, um, support what teachers are doing in the classroom, administrators, school board members, and the like. But at the same time, they're just scared. I'll just put it out there. I'll just go ahead and call it what it is. They're scared um, that something is going to happen. Um, and I mean, I have to be perfectly honest with you in full transparency. I am very careful about what I say in the classroom. Although I have been teaching to kill a mockingbird for a thousand years, this year is just different. It's just getting differently. <laughs> and I mean, people have, you know, have that book on their shelves. It's a classic. <laughs> and it's like, all of a sudden, I'm scared to talk about the topics that are included within it, the language that's included for fear that somebody is going to call and ask questions. Um, but what pushes me forward is that there are important conversations that need to be had around any and all of these books, novels, what have you, um, that it, they just need to be had. Um, and it's funny that we're talking about the word gifted, I literally had a conversation with a student about that. And I said, just because you're gifted does not mean necessarily that you're, <laughs> you're util utilizing those gifts wisely. You need to really, I mean, it's really about delivery of instruction and how I teach you. It's like, that's not what, gifted means smart. Um, Not necessarily, wait a minute, let's talk about that. Let's have a conversation. <laughs> Dara. One 
thing that I thought about um, is that with standard six, culturally responsive practices, um, I think it's called, uh, culturally responsive teaching and equitable practices, um, the sample performance indicators, if one of them included the word exceptionalities or gifted learners or something like that, like 6.2 um, talks about um, fostering access and achievement across uh, race, ethnicity, English language learners, students with disabilities. What if you actually had in there students with exceptionalities or, or gifted learners or something? Um, because I think that's how we start to infuse this idea that these are a population of students that can't be ignored. So um, I was just trying to think of different action steps. And uh, I, I, I was looking at that, um, uh, that one post that um, somebody put in about critical race theory and culturally responsive teaching having that same acronym and how sad it is that people misunderstand and misrepresent um, what that looks like. But how do, we, how do we go beyond that to really capitalize on culturally responsive teaching in gifted education? So I think that, um, I don't know what the possibilities of adding to that guidance document are, uh, Donna, you would know that. But, but I'm trying to think of like valuable ways where people are going to have to actually access that information and use it um, on a more global way. Just an idea. So Derek, can I just shoot something really quickly to you? Um, and it's, it's something that um, Melanie's division is already doing just like even more broadly than we're doing a book study using Dr. Hammond's book. Um, it was put on pause, <laughs> sadly. Um, it's supposed to be picked back up next school year. I think that's for a couple of different reasons. You know, let this breathe a little bit. Um, but people are encouraged to continue to read and um, study the book as well as incorporate um, different strategies that are within it, within their own teaching practices. Um, but again, it has to be intentional. It has to be, um, this is something that we are going to do. And it was pushed system-wide. Were teachers upset about it? Yes, they were, but somebody told them that they had to do something that they may not necessarily have wanted to do, but was good for them. It's like call for person. So, um, but it is something that um, was intentional. I think we are gonna pick it back up um, next school year, um, but it, it has to be something like that, um, you know, along those lines. Um, I, I wanna make sure that we hit um, our conversation about uh, uh, and around differentiated instruction. That was another key topic that came up um, in our survey. Um, and I, I mean, I'll just throw it out to you all uh, because I'm sure that the some of the my ideas are um, things that you all would come up with. But the the two that um, again speaking on um, intentionality um, is providing um, professional development not just to gifted teachers, but to all teachers, um, because they're in the classroom with all of our students. Um, and then also providing um, uh, information, um, temp lesson planning templates, research-based strategies, that's, that sort of thing at all levels. Um, I know in our division, there, there was at one point, and hope it, it's starting to kind of move through the pipeline, but there is a concerted like sort of emphasis on elementary school because I know that that's where a lot of students are identified. But by the, get, by the time they get to middle school, it gets a little shaky. And then they, you know, they come to a high school classroom and then they again have a dedicated resource teacher essentially in the classroom. Um, so one of the things that I'm, I'm talking about is basically, you know, to, a toolkit, if you will, I hate to use that word because it's overused, but something that um, teachers can go to for resources 
not just those that are not identified, that are certified as, as gifted teachers, but those who teach gifted students so they can provide um, scaffolding, that sort of thing within their own classroom, but at all three levels um, in education. But then also what was helpful for me, and this is how I actually became certified, is looking for opportunities to partner with local universities um, or um, you know, to provide some sort of cohort um, group to get certified in gifted education. Um, in the before times, way before the, um, <laughs> not just the pandemic, but um, when we are, um, the recession, um, I was able to get my certification through UVA um, and when I was working uh, in Henrico County Public Schools. And so just looking for opportunities where we can um, kind of um, look for teachers who might be interested in getting um, that sort of um, training and background um, and partnering with um, local um, universities. Some, some do that, but then others do not. Corey, I will mention also that the NAGC has the credential, the micro credential program. Yep. I am an assessor for that program. Mm -hmm. We started and then when COVID hit that everything was sort of put to the wayside. I can inform the group. We have a meeting, those of us who are currently NAGC credential assessors, we have a meeting next week and we are going to lift that program back up off the ground. So after our winter break in the new year, I should be able to provide the group um, with information about how teachers can sign up for and participate in that NAGC micro credential program for gifted ed. So that will be an option. Um, it didn't die, it's coming back. So that's a good thing. And, and just to dovetail off of that, the um... State Department is also looking at micro credentials and how um, how they will uh, be utilized in the future by the State Department's um, teacher licensure area and what that means and and um, you know what the options are going to be and that that is something that is um, going to start more detailed discussion later on. Um, after the start of the new year. I would ask Felicia just quickly, because I don't want to lose track of time and what we're doing is we are just brainstorming issues that, for each one of those two things. And I think, you know, one of the major things I got um, out of the first one identification was really getting the word out and what does it mean and that kind of thing. But can you provide Felicia for us what you have in the notes with regard to um, items that we brainstormed under that category and then maybe just the few items that um, Corey's already mentioned for differentiation and then so that we get back on track with getting any other ideas that we might want to list here because that will help us think about how we approach this in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, so to begin with, I think that we could, when it comes to equitable representation and identification, we could maybe revisit that 2017 report. I don't know if we would want to make a subcommittee to do that on diversity, and we could look at how in light of um, the regulations being on hold currently, we may want to go ahead and think about if those do not go through, couple those ideas from the report with the current regs, what tweaks could we make there? I think we could also look at how can we take the information from that report and share with local divisions? How can we put that back on their radar so that administrators, parents, school board members, teachers, everyone in the community understands what gifted is, 
how it pertains to their division and how we are looking to possibly move forward. Okay. For the um, differentiation in the professional development, I think that we could look at maybe compiling some sort of a resource for school divisions, for teachers. Um, we may want to also reach out to the regional consortiums and the state consortium. So we could look at what resources are they providing for professional development. I know region seven provides um, typically once a month, they have some sort of PD session either for administrators or teachers. Could that be shared statewide? The state consortium, when I was still on the board, we were doing like every other month, we were having some sort of PD session. So maybe this group, we could reach out to other groups and have some sort of resource point either a page or a document so that school divisions can say, okay, this is going on this day. We have this PD session going on this day. We have um, these universities who offer classes. Here's how you can get in touch with them. Here's the NAGC information if you wanna use that for professional development. I think if we were able to package everything up neat and nice and give it to divisions and say, here, <laughs> this is how you can provide some resources and support for your teachers. Um, so Felicia, on our, on our website, we have um, some things that we might want to go back and look at from the publications that as a committee we've, um, that we've done in the past. Um, a couple of um, cycles um, ago, we have, there are some resources on um, the VDOE website for students at the middle school level, the high school level. Mm -hmm. Um, in other levels, different um, <clears throat> pockets. So we might want to just kind of definitely, whenever we put together these subgroups, that mm -hmm. that is something that they make sure that they kind of look at um, because it's it, it might not be a situation where we have to like reinvent the wheel, but it's more of a refreshing of information um, that we've already put together um, and just kind of tweaking. Um, in, in addition, um, we have um, information from Project Promise on the website, but there may be some others where we're talking uh, different organizations or um, toolkits that we can put together. That might be where we could house that information where we put mm -hmm. together that particular subgroup as well. And I think with some of the information that already exists, because turnover is so frequent in gifted ed in Virginia, some of the people who are the division point person for gifted don't even know that these things are out there. So if we had a way to say, here's your resource document for middle level gifted learners, um, I think it would be a nice way for us to package it all together and say, here you go. I also think it'd be helpful for teachers who are looking at planning what they want to do for their SMART goals and to have that readily available so they're not digging through kind all kinds of things kind of Corey, like what you were saying you wanted to do this this is how you did it so here's the example of a pathway and um i think it would probably support them a lot better having that readily available and be checked off a lot quicker with their division principal i mean building principal want to be mindful of the time, but um, other ideas or brainstorm that haven't been mentioned for one or, uh, for either of those two categories that somebody ha who hasn't had opportunity to speak would like to uh, bring up. Thanks, Wendy. And one thing that we're doing in our division is looking at local norms and how those, we can incorporate that into our uh, evaluation process. And I would love to put together a list of resources or some type of guiding document um, in that area. And that would be something that I would, I would be very interested in. I agree that's regardless of whatever way our, our regulations move forward. Um, I think that 
some kind of document around local norms is would be extremely helpful. Last year, the state consortium had a professional development training um, with Dr. Scott Peters pertaining to local norms. And we do have a recording of that. I'm not sure where I could share it. I know it's on the state consortium website, but it might be that we could cross link that to this group's website as well. So there are resources out there, but I think they're so scattered here, there, and everywhere, if we could come up with a way to have them in, in one central location. And then if we look at somehow continuing to remind divisions, here are things you can do to increase equity. Here are things you can do to support your teachers. We can't just push it out there and then let it be. We have to give them these continual reminders of this is important. This is how you address this. Because if not gifted, it's just gonna to go to the back of their mind like it often does, unfortunately. We could add a page to the gifted education page, you know, another page where um, people could go and see different resources based on different topic areas um, mixed in with our documents as well. You know, it, um, that's a possibility. I think that would be wonderful if we could somehow do that. And then maybe um, one of the things of this group, one of the things we could do is determine what resources we think should go there. That right, we, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's, you know, whether they be ones we created, ones we have modified and, and redone here recently, you know, to put in there for, for specifically for this um, or um, links to outside resources that we find helpful. Um, I, I think, you know, there's certainly opportunity to do that. Um, really quickly, Donna, before we move on to reports from um, representative groups, um, another um, idea that I had um, is, I mean, and this is kind of going along with what Felicia said about um, the recording that Dr. Peters has done is um, maybe invite experts in specifically differentiated learning like Dr. Tomlinson and others to maybe do a webinar that could be, again, linked to our website um, specifically on differentiated learning as it relates to um, gifted students. So just 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 another idea that I just want to throw out there. Um, are there any other um, any other comments before we move on? I'm pretty excited about the subcommittees. <laughs> <laughs> That's where the work is done, is it not, Tom? <laughs> That's where the rubber meets the road. Okay, so um. If, they, if we want to go around, is this the time where we do the, the lightning round, Donna? This is a lightning round. Okay. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I, Felicia, I don't know if you have everybody's name in order, if you want to call on people so that you can um, put them into the minutes, that's fine. I think that's probably the better way. I currently have everyone listed. Um, I went ahead and copied and pasted. And so if it's, they're in no particular order. <laughs> okay. So Corey, Corey, do you want me to go ahead and just call names? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. So first we have Christine Hill. And... I'm going to take that as a pass. I don't see anything in the chat box from her. And then Cheryl, would you like to share? 
Uh, yes, I would. Um, I'm involved with the um, regional science fair at at the regional level and the state level. And many of the students who are identified as gifted and talented follow along in those programs. And recently we were made aware of Rise for the World organization. And I thought it was very uh, appropriate to share with this group because they're identifying um, what they call brilliant, talented young people starting ages 15 to 17 and offering them benefits for a lifetime. And it is funded by the Schmidt Futures and the Rhodes Trust. And so I will put the link in uh, the area, but I thought it was something that um, um, is getting some real attention and some absolutely wonderful stories. Thank you. And David, David Knapp, would you like to share? Yeah, I'll share a few things really quickly. First, I threw okay. some um, information in the chat that I think are in the minutes about some of the strategies mm -hmm. that our school divisions are using for uh, increasing diversity and equity in their gifted programs that I think might be worth digging into a little bit more in some of our subcommittees. Um, and I'm going to throw some links in the chat, but um, <clears throat> we recently hosted a a seminar that might be of interest about how COVID-19 has impacted the mental health of PK-12 students. We've been doing some uh, deep dive research on this, so I'll share that in the chat. And then we have a series of uh, seminars that are coming up in the spring that are focused on um, issues related to teacher retention during the pandemic, which has definitely been a, a big, uh, it's always a critical issue, but especially in the wake of COVID-19, something for us to consider. So. Um, I'll share some information in the chat for anybody who might be interested in those resources. Thank you. James. Okay. James, uh, there's, James. No, there's James. Yeah, sorry, I was muted and I always forget to <laughs> unmute myself uh, before I talk. Uh, really not much. The only thing uh, that uh, we to really report that might be of interest, uh, we have a diversity report and goals on accessible on our website since this issue came up. And it has the demographics listed of the students who actually apply uh, to the governor school for the program. And then also the uh, demographics of the students who have been accepted to the program. Very yeah. nice, thank you. Yeah. And if there is going to be a subcommittee about trying to uh, encourage the middle schools to uh, have students apply to governor schools, whether they're the, the part-time or full-time, I would definitely be willing to serve on that one because actually I'm the student recruiter for our school and I've been doing it for a number of years and yeah, we need to get the word out. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Thank you. And then Liza. Thank you. It's Lisa. Um, Lisa. It's okay. Um, so different things happening here in Alexandria. Um, we are revising our school board policy and regulations for gifted education. Um, it's very dated, almost 20 years old. And our populations have changed a lot. And, and because of that, we have a lot of issues right now with the uh, um, identification process that we are we, we have in place. So um, that's one thing, I'm part of that committee. The other one is the TAG Advisory Committee for ACP, ACPS. We are also just making these two actually topics that we have as a focus with this committee is our, our same topics of focus. So this is wonderful. And um, something that is just right now, we just, um, um, started that work as school principals is looking at handover research um, in our uh, data on the diversity and the representation of our populations um, for these different specialized programs. So different things happening here. Um, hopefully, you know, align with everything that we're doing here in this committee. Thank you. And I, I think I saw Lori said she will pass. And then Melanie. 
Um, I've spoken a lot today, but a, a little self-promotion. Um, I was interviewed about talent development in an online, um, uh, let me see if I can find it, uh, around just changing gifted ed. Um, and I'll share that with you. Uh, it was very, um, it was very informative and, you know, I'm kind of proud of, at least I sounded somewhat composed, so. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. And then I think I saw Megan said pass and Rebecca, Rebecca said pass. Let's see, Shelly. Yeah, sure. Uh, I don't have much uh, just to report that um, taking a look at our identification uh, processes and data is a part of our equity work in Frederick County. Okay. Thank you. And then let's see, Tracy is a pass. Okay, and then Wendy. I'd like just like to share that in our division, we're very fortunate to have a grant from the Jack Kent Cook Foundation to support our talent development efforts. And it's really a three pronged approach. And so we have a parent and family academy to provide resources for families to support their high ability learners. We have a student component where we are trying to incorporate some enrichment activities through the Think Law program. You might be familiar with it through Collins mm -hmm. Field. And we also have a teacher component. We're providing professional development on best practices for identifying and supporting our gifted and high ability learners from underrepresented populations. And so we're really trying to get that off the ground and expand it. And um, it's a wonderful project. And so if any of you have any resources you'd like to share for that, we'd love to have. Them. Thank you. I'm gonna pass. I did share the thing about the NAGC credentials. Corey, do you want to share? Just something really quickly. Um, mm -hmm. And I know how big or small this is, um, but it, it's actually um, what I fall into, which is we now have a full-time gifted resource teacher certified in gifted education in every school, which has not always been the case. And I may have been one of the last ones who's actually full time in the division um, because it was not like that at um, the school that I'm currently in um, for a good while. Um, the person that was in this role, she was certified but she did not um, provide instruction. She was part-time and it was more of an advisory sort of role. And so we do have um, teachers in every building that are doing everything from, of course, push in and pull out services, but um, just at every level. Um, and we meet, you know, frequently, um, but it is, <laughs> it sounds weird to say it out loud. It's like, oh, you all have, so, so what, but that's not always the case. And then also being able to reach out to other individuals in the building that are, that are teaching gifted students that can also um, benefit from, like I said before that, those partnerships. So I'm gonna be talking with Anne about what can we do um, at the division level uh, because we, she, she has been collecting that sort of data. Um, who is actually providing services to students and who's actually certified so that she could better um, support those teachers. Because mm -hmm. we have, I'm a, I'm a cluster teacher, um, but the, the gentleman that teaches social studies on the other day is not, <laughs> is not certified. So how can we better support all teachers across the board um, in terms of gifted education? 
Oh, that is wonderful. No, that's that's a big deal to have certified in every building. Okay, so Janin, I saw had a pass. Let's see, Carla. She passed. Okay. Yeah, I, I passed, sorry. Okay, and then Roseanne. I think Roseanne might be off. Is she off? Yeah. Okay. And then Dara had a pass and Kim wanted to pass. Is there anyone who I missed or who would like to chime in? It's okay. Did I miss anyone? I, 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 you oh. didn't miss me. I said I was going to pass. Oh, but then once she started talking about the um, the resource teacher, I was like, I don't know if I shared this last time, but this is the first year that we actually have um, ARTs beginning to work with our middle schools. So our advanced academic resource teachers are now in six middle schools supporting staff and, and colleagues, and they've been participating in um, uh, professional development. And um, so it's really exciting to see this this move up to the secondary level. So I was like, oh, thank you, Corey, for sharing that because that made me think, oh my goodness, how, it's it's something that's like in your, you already realize and you're like, oh yeah, we should share that with others. So I'm excited that six of the schools now have that. Oh, fantastic. Okay, so did I miss anyone else? Did everyone have a chance? I'm gonna share out something. <laughs> okay. Um, so kind of behind the scenes, we've been working on um, a toolkit for twice exceptional uh, teacher for teachers um, to look at. And so it'll, it'll really even provide some basic um, strategies and then explain more about the, each strategy. You'll be able to click on a strategy on the index and it'll take you straight to that strategy. Um, and some lesson plan samples and things like that. So um, we're looking at having that posted on the website, both on the um, SPED page, as well as the gifted page as a resource um, sometime in late January, early February timeframe. But, um, you know, I think It'll be helpful. It'll it'll be uh, user friendly for the teachers to be able to go in and access that. Um, Fantastic. Okay, so I think we got everyone. And so Corey, I'm gonna send it back over to you. So um, I'll take the lead on this because we do, I did send it out to you individually, but I wanna read it so that it is part of the recorded um, um, meeting. So it was an email and it says, hi, on behalf of the anti-racist alumni of Maggie Walker Governor School, we are writing to the Virginia Advisory Council for the Education of the gifted with a couple of our concerns. One, we are significantly concerned about the potential blocking the local control over admission practices with the new administration taking over in January. Maggie Walker Governor School has started making important steps towards making their admission process more equitable. And we don't want this progress to be upended by new statewide mandates that prevent these research-based updates. Number two, we would like to push for clearer demographic and enrollment data reporting of governor schools through the Virginia Department of Education. Currently, these data are only reported at the county level first, meaning that any governor school with multi-county enrollment does not have publicly available annual enrollment data. Thank you, best regards, Rachel Savoy 
Caldwell, and then there's a link to um, the Maggie Walker site. And all this will be copied and pasted into the minutes as well. Um, and at this time, I'll turn it back over to um, Corey. Well, thank you, um, Donna, and thank you all for coming today. Um, just a quick reminder that our next meeting is February the 11th. I believe that should be at the, at the bottom of your agenda. I'm sure that Donna will let us know um, <clears throat> if this will be face-to-face uh, -face or if this is going to be um, virtual um, as we've been conducting it so far this year. Um, but I want to thank you all for coming in. Um, we look forward to um, putting together those subcommittees so we can uh, do some good work together. Thank you all for coming today. You all have a wonderful holiday season. We'll see you on the other side. Bye guys, thank you. Donna for the February meeting. I'm gonna be in Chicago for the um, NAPDS uh, conference. If I'm able to attend virtually, I'll actually still come. And if I, unless I'm presenting that morning, so.